Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen, amen. God is good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate Tim opening for us this morning. Thank you, Roberto, and uh, our abbreviated worship team. Got a lot of people missing today, but that's okay. They're just they're just missing. Praise the Lord. It's worship team light today. It's worship team light. Hallelujah. And it's actually congregation light today. It's all good. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. Please be seated. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Thank all of you for being here. Praise the Lord. Appreciate you showing up, even though many are absent. It's, uh, you know, summer, the weather's nice, and people do stuff. Praise the Lord. Make sure you uh, shake hands with our visitor this morning and let him know how much we appreciate him being with us. Uh, do not let him leave without letting him know. We appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to have you all back. You know, I, you know, age is, I know it's a relevant thing, so, but I, I noticed uh, here this week, I spent 20 minutes looking for my phone in the truck using the flashlight on my phone. <laughs> Just cannot figure out sometimes, you know, yeah, has, it, has that ever happened to you? You know, you're looking all over for your phone and can't figure it out. Where could it have gone? Praise the Lord. All right, so God is good. I want to uh, want to talk to you about some things this morning, and uh, I'll just start off by saying this is a kind of a counterintuitive, but there is no I in denial. If you follow my drift, praise the Lord. And that's kind of what I'm dealing with here this morning. So. In 1 Corinthians, I want to start there, Sheila, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All right, now John chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Praise God. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now no matter what you're going through, and we've heard a lot of things this morning, uh, prayer requests, testimonies, experiences that we've all had but no matter what you're going through you can drink from the finished work of Christ amen and that will answer whatever problem you're focused on amen Jacob's well is a picture of all of the things that uh, humanity uses to try to satisfy their needs satisfy their thirst for life this woman went to the well and she found Jesus, who is the well. And before the day was over, she became a well. Let's look at John chapter 4 and verse 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, you know, some people say, and we hear it in religious circles, especially uh, the background I come from which is the holiness kind of Pentecostal which is just really kind of in your face stuff amen and they would say that sin separates you from God but sin didn't separate Adam from God as a matter of fact God pursued him Adam where are you he said well I'm hiding because I'm naked 
their nakedness didn't really bother God. The truth is God knew they were naked long before they knew they were naked. They were naked long before they realized they were naked. And it didn't bother God. If people stopped running from God and ran to God, they'd find that He is the source of all supply. That's right. So the question this morning is, what are you drinking from? Jesus said, I am He. Everything flows from God. Everything comes from a God-given revelation of who Jesus really is and who Jesus says you are. He is the living water. He is the I am that I am. A revelation of Jesus to you will produce a revelation of Jesus through you. There's nothing that you need that a revelation of Jesus Christ and who He is will not satisfy. The more you know, the more there is available. So let's look at, again, John. Uh, this time let's look at John 1. And I want to read verses 12 through 17, Sheila. John 1, 12 through 17. So as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right? John chapter 4. And verses 4 through 8. And then we'll move along. Praise the Lord. John 4, verses 4 through 8. He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Praise the Lord. Disciples went to go get lunch, and Jesus is setting up the well. Now, here's the deal. At the time that this is taking place, the Jews would go out of their way to not go through Samaria. There was a lot of prejudice. There was a lot of hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. They did not see eye to eye on anything. They could not get along. Amen. They tried to not have anything to do with each other. To the point that if a first century Jew heard this story or read this story, they would think that John was making a point that Jesus had to go through Samaria because he didn't have any other choice. A road was closed or there was... Uh, some natural catastrophe that came up that prevented him from going around Samaria. He was forced, you know, to go through it. There's some obstacle or something that was causing this to happen. So, guys, let's just look at it this way. Say that somebody uh, at work asks you, what did you do last night? Now, you're not going to simply say, well, I went looking uh, at women's shoes. It was an awkward silence, which I was expecting to come. That would be awkward for everybody, right? You'd say, I had to go look at women's shoes. Amen. See what I'm saying? You, you're just not going to, you know, I like women's shoes. No. <laughs> the phrase, I had to go, is what's important here. Yeah. So Jesus is making it clear he didn't have an option. He was forced into it. Right? Now, that's how a Jewish reader of that time would have read this. He had to go. He was forced to go. But it seems clear to me that Jesus wasn't forced to go to Samaria as if Jesus could be forced to go anywhere. Amen? Instead, Jesus went out of his way to go to Samaria. 
had to go seems to be used more like he had an appointment. He had a destiny. He had to be there. It's like uh, he looked on a calendar and, uh, and he saw that he was supposed to be at a specific place uh, at a specific time to meet a specific person. Th there was going to be this amazing meeting, this, this collision, amen, and God had circled it on the calendar. Yes. That day, you got to be there. Grace came by Jesus. Grace was pursuing this woman. And it caught up with her at this well outside of town. Truth is, grace pursues everybody. And we all have a collision at some point. All of those of us that have accepted Christ. Jesus had to go to Samaria. So he arrives there about noon. It's the hard, hottest part of the day. And he sits down to rest. And the disciples go into town to buy food. Now, first of all, this is a really weird time of day and a weird place to meet somebody. People came to the well early in the morning or late at night. It's hot. We're talking about in the Middle East here. It's blazing hot at noon. Amen? So it's the heat of the day. They wouldn't come there then. And in those days, women would go to the well together. They would all gather together. It was like a, you know, kind of a social event as well as a, a activity or a job that they had to do every day, but they would do it all together. That's how they would exchange their daily information and I don't want to say gossip, but just conversation. Amen. So she either avoided the others or the others were avoiding her. Amen. Maybe it was both. This woman had a rough past. This woman had a reputation, amen, a bad reputation. She was probably tired of being judged, tired of being whispered about behind her back, tired of the sideways glances, amen. So she went by herself. She picked a time of day when she knew there wasn't going to be anybody there. It would only be her. So she arrives, and Jesus asked her for a drink. Now, she's not sure how to respond to this because this is a Jewish guy speaking to her, a Samaritan woman. Amen? So she calls him out on it. Look at John 4, verses 9 and 10. Rarely would men address women unless it was their spouse or a, or a family member to begin with. Now, the last thing you would expect is a Jewish man to speak to a Samaritan woman. It just, it, it fights all of the norms, uh, you know, the social mores of the time. It just wasn't done. Amen. So she calls him out. She knows this is weird. This is just not normal behavior. So she calls him out on it. She said, the woman of Samaria said unto him, how is it that you, being a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, because you don't have nothing to do with the Jews. We have no dealings with the, the Jews and the Samaritans, right? And Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that you're talking to, give me the drink, who's asking you for the drink, you'd have asked him. The guy that's asking you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now she's really confused. Because she's thinking in terms of physical water. She's thinking in terms of physical thirst. Amen. So she points out that Jesus doesn't even have a bucket to draw this water with. Amen? And Jesus explains to her, I'm the living water. Right? And if she drinks this water, then she'll never thirst again. Amen? So she's still trying to get her mind around this metaphor. And so Jesus tries to be more direct. He takes a more direct approach. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband. Tell him to come over. The woman answered and said, I haven't got a husband. And Jesus said unto her, That's a fact. You have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the guy you're shacking up with now isn't your husband. In that, you have told the truth. Right? Now, that's awkward. That's uncomfortable. And she's probably ready to go back to the metaphor now. 
because now this is in your face stuff. But she goes on. The well that she's been drawing from isn't quenching her thirst. Jesus isn't going to pretend that everything is okay. This is the collision. Life with grace. John chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say, in Jerusalem is a place where men are supposed to worship. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to pause in the story here for a moment. And I want you to look at some false assumptions. This woman is making false assumptions or understandings about Jesus. These are the same assumptions that can cause people to miss grace in their own lives. So she starts out, assumption number one, she says, if a person, and here's, here's the assumption, if a person assumes that Jesus doesn't have any interest in them, there's a good chance they've never had much interest in him. Praise the Lord. It's not that they don't want grace. They're just convinced that grace doesn't want anything to do with them. See, rejection, anybody that's experienced it knows it's a horrible feeling. And this woman's history is filled with rejection. That's right. Five husbands. So she's at the point, and, and probably has been for years, where she doesn't allow herself to be vulnerable. Yeah. She's not taking any risk. That's right. If I don't commit, I can't be hurt. If I don't commit, then I can't, then I don't have to deal with rejection. Right? So Jesus went out of his way to be with this woman. It's grace. Grace. It chased her down. Because that's what grace does. He was ready to meet her right where she was. Praise the Lord. Assumption number two. Notice what she does at this well in the conversation. She tries to distract Jesus by talking about religion. She tries to avoid this collision by getting him into a religious dialogue into a religious argument something something you could debate forever you say you worship here I say, you know we say you worship there and on and on and on and on how are you doing it when are you going to do it how are you going to do it so even today to this day grace gets overlooked and the reason it gets overlooked is because the church gets caught up in religious arguments difficult interpretations instead of focusing on the truth, which is the love of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God. Religious people in general, just like this woman, have a tendency to get religious when Jesus starts to get personal. It used to bother me, just on a personal note, when people would email me or write me, or even in a conversation they would get into some interpretation detail that they think I'd missed. I still get them, I just don't care anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't just, in a kind of general way, people have left this church because of this very thing that I'm talking about. And I could name people, but I'm just going to give three examples. I'm not naming names. I'm just going to give three examples. But within these three examples, I think every, kind of everything falls. One, we had a, a, a lady who had come from the same uh, holiness, Pentecostal background that we had come from. We had left the denomination. I had resigned a church, and we had moved on, and felt like God was dealing with me about there's a lot of things going on there were great people a lot of good truth a lot of revelation but also a lot of just religious stuff that really wasn't biblical it was just an interpretation of something and so we weren't angry with anybody we just resigned and moved on 
But this lady was still into it, you know. And when we took this church and we moved into this building, we were, there were quite a few people that had come from that same denomination that were here initially. Uh, as you can see, they're not here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But there's one particular person. One of the things was uncut hair. That was one of the legalistic kind of things. There's lots of them, but I'm just using this one for women. It was uncut hair. Now, she embraced the jewelry because that was something you didn't have either, jewelry. No jewelry, no, nothing. Except the preachers, they all had Rolex watches, but <laughs> nobody else could have any jewelry. Uh, I mean, it's just a kind of a hypocritical thing, but it was just a fact. You weren't supposed to wear any adorning kind of jewelry and stuff like that, and just anything that would draw attention to yourself. She embraced that, I mean, like a wildcat when she found out, hey, God's not mad at people that wear rings and necklaces. You know, it's okay. But she couldn't let go of that hair because it was a point of pride. I mean, it drugged the ground. And when other women who had come from the same organization began to come with their hair cut, it really ticked her off. And we had several conversations about it. And I said, I don't know what is bothering you. Nobody's telling you you have to cut your hair. You know, if you want to keep your hair long, beautiful. It's up to you. That's between you and God. But they don't have to keep their hair long to make it to heaven. You know, she couldn't get it. She couldn't understand it. She just, it just infuriated her. And eventually they left. There were some other issues, but that was the thing that stuck out to me because it was the whole idea of the covering and submission and so on and so forth, which she was the least submitted woman I think I've ever known outside of my own wife. Oh, so That's a joke. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, but you know how we feel. We're, we're, women are not subservient to men. I mean, anybody that thinks that is living on a, another planet. It's not to be that way. It was never intended to be that way. That's why the scripture says, and Jesus spoke it himself, there's no male, there's no female, there's no Gentile, there's no Jew. You know, we are all the same to God. And if we don't relate to one another that way, we get problems. Problems are the result. Amen. So I'm just, I'm just making a joke just to irritate my wife. Please, the Lord. Because that's what I do. Okay, so then the, then the, the next category was a fellow who was only into the manifestation, I, I'd call it, which is, you know, like the being slain in the spirit. We've had it. We've experienced this stuff. Uh, you know, the, the bucking, the jerking, you know. The, and I'm not against it. I'm not saying it, isn't, it doesn't happen. I'm saying that is flesh. It's a fleshly response to something that's happening emotionally, something spiritual that's happening. It's not wrong. But that's not the Holy Ghost. That's our response to the Holy Ghost. And that's the only thing he wanted. And when I would be preaching on grace, it would irritate him. And so he just kind of quit coming. And unless he came, and then pretty soon he just, I used to get emails from him, like I talked about. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I tried to answer him. I tried to, and then I just thought, you know what? This isn't about this. This is about an argument. This is just somebody wanting to argue, you know? So I just let it go. Okay, that's another one. Another example. And is a guy that was trying to, he used religion to manipulate his wife. He wanted her to submit totally to him, to whatever he said. In other words, no matter what he said, whether it was biblical or not, she was supposed to kowtow. And that was the big deal to him. Now, I'm not saying wives should not submit to your husbands, but husbands are supposed to submit to their wives. They're supposed to love one another. This isn't about... Who's got power over somebody? That's not the way it's supposed to work. But that's, way he, that's where he was coming from. So he would try to get me to say certain things that would keep her in this subservient role and him kind of in the power position. Well, then when she'd ask me a question and I'd tell her the truth, he'd get really upset about it. Now, I wasn't trying to get in the middle of anything. If you don't want the answer, don't ask me, right. you know, and then I, you don't have to worry about it. So I wasn't picking sides there or anything. It was just that's the way it was. Well, he left with a shout and that he'd heard from God and we were all idiots, which could be or could not be true. I don't know, but that's not, that's not the point. The point was this was about a trying to, to turn everything into a religious argument instead of loving one another, instead of using the grace of God the way it's intended to be used 
amen, that we might come together and understand a true revelation of Jesus Christ so that we could be that revelation instead of just being an echoing spirit of some religious dogma, amen, that doesn't help anybody, that usually creates more conflict than it provides deliverance or healing or wholeness or anything else. I'm not against religion. I'm just against religion that doesn't bring Christ and His grace and His love and His mercy to the forefront because it's just not biblical. Amen? So I've learned that when somebody is especially determined to talk about religion, it's usually because their religion is what's dominating their life. They're really trying to keep Jesus from getting too personal because it's easier to be religious than it is to have a relationship with Christ. That was the whole issue of the Old Covenant. They couldn't come near to God because of their sin. So they had religious performances to act out, to go through, in order to have acceptance. Jesus came and fulfilled the law so that we could have relationship. He didn't come to bring another religion or a different religion or an add-on religion. He came to bring us the love of God and that relationship with God to be restored as it was originally with Adam and Eve. Amen. So this Samaritan woman wrongly assumes that Jesus is more interested in religion than her. And so she tries to get him into this religious debate. Jesus could care less. He's interested in her. He's come for her, not to fix her religion. Amen. So assumption number three then is she doesn't believe in water that will forever quench her thirst. Remember her history. She's, she's heard a lot of men make a lot of promises. And here's just another guy making another promise. That's what's going through her head. She's skeptical. She's had promise after promise after promise after promise broken. She's had a lot of men. And she's had a lot of men make a lot of promises. And each assumption that she has is like a brick in the wall. It's another step away from Jesus. It's another barrier to the love of God and to his grace. So she's ready, she's ready to be done with this conversation. She tries to wrap this up. John 4, 25. The woman says to him, I know that uh, when the Messiah comes, which is called Christ, when he comes, he's going to tell us everything. He'll straighten all this out. Now, don't miss the irony here. This is what's so powerful in this. Verse 26. Jesus said unto her, the guy's talking to you is me. The Messiah, the guy you're talking to is me. The one you're waiting for that has all the answers is the one that you're talking to right now. Now here's the irony of this is, this is the only time in his entire life when Jesus tells somebody that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. Usually he's telling everybody that comes up with that don't say anything. This is the only time that he does it. And it's to this Samaritan woman with this horrible reputation, this terrible past, who's been married five times and now is living with some guy. How's that for grace? This is, this is real God. This is God covered with a veil, a, a religious thing. This is God coming to somebody the least deserving and giving them the greatest revelation. See, the worst thing that could happen to a person is that they spend their whole life trying to, trying to get away from God, trying to outrun God because they think that He's chasing them to collect what they owe when He's really chasing them to give them something they could never afford. Praise God. God is good all the time. 
God is on your side all the time. God wants you blessed all the time. God wants you to know how much He loves you, how loved you are. Because it's only from that that you're able to love back. Some people keep Jesus at a distance. They make it about feelings. They make it about manifestations. They make it about special services or certain speakers. And others simply by avoiding God out of fear. Fear of retribution, fear of judgment, fear of big, big, get even. So maybe she couldn't forgive herself for what she'd done, for who she'd become. But then her life collides head on with grace. John 4, 28 through 30. Last scripture. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the man, Come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Is not this the Messiah, but the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. She drank from the well. She became a well. The collision is often messy. But it's beautiful. Because grace is always greater. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, grace is always greater. It may look messy, it may be uncomfortable, but it's beautiful because it's God connecting with humanity, showing him true self, who he really is and who he wants us to know him as so that we can be known as we truly are a well of living water, a Holy Ghost receptacle, a human filled with God. That's what he's about, pursuing humans to make us like God, to make us his children. The great grace collision. If you haven't experienced it, believe me, you will, because he's on your trail. Not to get you, but to bless you. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. God bless all of you for your patience this morning. Let's just uh, let God love us. Life will be a lot better. Amen. We don't have to be religious geeks and weirdos. We can just be weirdos and know that God loves us. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Make sure you shake hands with our visitor. Tell him how glad we are to have him with us today. Shake hands with one another. Tell him God's good and he loves me. Praise the Lord.